morning and welcome to the All Saints Liverpool YouTube service. Um, it's Anne who is leading you this morning and our, uh, the word is going to be opened up to us by Mike who is preaching and our prayers will be led by Chris. I just want to say thanks too to Ian who's putting the service together and Helen who's helping me record this this morning. First of all though, let's remember why we are here. I know we're not here in person, but we are gathered together online. We have come together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer him praise and thanksgiving. And actually in your homes, you will be able to join in with singing, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sins and to seek his grace that through his Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. I want to read a portion of scripture that is for this morning from Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. This is John's vision looking into heaven. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, for those of us who follow the Anglican Church calendar, today is Trinity Sunday, when we remember that mystery that we declare in the Creed, that we believe in one God, but three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And our first hymn, um, reflects that. So we're going to sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, Blessed Trinity. So let's listen or sing together in our first hymn. Oh 
As we come before God, we realise that we fail to live up to his standards. We've sinned. The Bible tells us if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We'll just have a short pause, um, pause while we remember those things that we have actually done wrong in the last week. And then we'll say together the confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against other people and against your creation in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. 1 John 1 verse 9 also tells us, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so it says, Forgiven sinners, that we come to worship the King of Kings in royal robes I don't deserve. So let's listen to our next hymn before we have our reading and Mike will preach to us. <laughs>
Hello everybody and welcome to this, the talk part of our service. My name's Mike and I'm one of the vicars from All Saints. Now our Bible reading today is taken from Galatians 3 verses just 26 to 29. And Paul says this, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, we are, as I hope you now know, introducing and inviting you into a conversation about who we are as a church community and where God is leading us. And we are offering, because we have to offer, because you need to start the conversation somewhere, this uh, job of thinking about our future. All Saints Liverpool growing God's kingdom. What does that look like? So, so far, we have looked at how we may get to be this community, what gifts we're seeking from God to enable that to happen. And we've thought about generosity and excellence and courage. And this week, well, we offer you the topic of equality. Now, all of these headings can take longer than one talk. There's no doubt about that. But bearing in mind all that is happening in the world at the moment, the question of equality does seem to be huge. And here I am. And mostly, if I'm honest, I'm completely overwhelmed and lost in quite what to say. In one sense, of course, it seems easy because doesn't every organisation have an equal opportunities policy? So why not just say that? Because in effect, what they say is treat everyone fairly all the time. But another way, because many of those organisations clearly just treat them as words. And whilst in one sense it's accepted in our culture that we need to treat people fairly, it certainly does not happen. Look around you, listen to story. And as we go about our ordinary lives, some people just because of the colour of their skin, their ethnic background, their religious belief or sexuality. Some people who through bad choices perhaps are in addiction or are street sex workers or are homeless. They are just treated differently. And not just differently, they're treated as if they are somehow less than human beings. Now, it's just been slightly over a year since George Floyd was killed in police custody in the United States, an event which sparked protests around the world. If you don't know, he was an unarmed black man who was stopped by police in Minneapolis and died after being held down by a police officer. And this officer, Derek Chauvin, lost his job, was later found guilty of George, Flo George Floyd's murder. And this death led to lots of debate about racism and inequality. And there were big Black Lives Matter marches in lots of countries, including our own, calling for changes to policing, for changes to education and changes to culture. Now, if I'm honest, as I sat and watched it on television, I was appalled by such behaviour and the apparent clear racism within the police department. But as I kind of sat back drinking my cup of tea, I just reflected on the fact that it's an American thing, isn't it? Now, I have lived most of my life believing I treated people fairly and with equality. And in fact, since becoming a Christian, I've looked in horror on the unequal treatment, not just on the basis of skin colour, of, of people who are seen to be less than human. And I find it hard to understand and have believed that actually my activity, my actions, my belief, my language is clear of that inequality, that I'm not treating people badly myself. I'm not discriminating myself. I'm not uh, being racist myself. And yet, how does the saying go? 
It just takes good people doing nothing for evil to prosper. Now, I probably don't have enough time here to answer all of my own questions, but I hope I have enough to help you ask more of yourself, of your community and your culture and the beliefs that you hold. Because I have come to understand that there are many pressures in life that are really unfair to different people in different places. Only just in the, the last couple of months, I heard a story of a potential vicar refused a role because of the colour of his skin. Racial abuse of the vilest kind through social media. A friend refused a house. They were told, I'm not letting this house to your type. I heard someone doing the English thing of talking slowly and shouting, as if skin colour means they don't understand. Well, these are just a few examples in Liverpool recently, and they are very real. But there are many others as well. Political things like the asylum system and housing benefit, but also the way we treat people who come to the hub or walk into our church buildings and who clearly are struggling, either trying to wrestle with poverty, deal with addiction, or street sex workers, People who are human beings, and yet we treat them somehow as if they are less than that. And this goes on around me. And I can still say, well, listen, I, I really genuinely believe I don't have any part in it. But I know and have come to understand the truth. That I have never challenged, never stood up, never did what I believe Jesus would want me to do. And understand the problems and the situations better so that I am able to respond. Remember, for evil people to prosper, good people just have to do nothing. Now, this isn't a new problem by any stretch of the imagination. Paul came across it in the early church in the region of Galatia in Asia Minor, which is now modern day Turkey. He planted four churches with his friend Bartholomew and they had um, these church communities have been joined by people who were Jewish and people who were non-Jewish. And the Jewish people had, with a sense of greater authority and understanding of God, portrayed themselves as being, not always, but often, better. And so the major debate within the early church was, do you have to be a Jew first, following the Old Testament laws before you were a true Christian? Now, Paul was very clear about this as a Jew himself, but he always taught no. After all, he left a, a number of thriving churches for whom this was not an issue. But after he left this particular area and moved to plant other churches, people who taught this idea that Jew, you had to be a Jew first came behind and demanded of the whole congregation such things as circumcision and food laws and rules for the Sabbath. You can imagine how that would ha not help within relationships. And Paul was livid, and so he wrote to pretty much say so. In our piece, he says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Can you almost feel him thumping the table as he said it in his frustration bursting over? Now the whole Bible teaches that we are all, regardless of gender, sexuality, culture, race or religion, regardless of the decisions that we've made or the places in life that we find ourselves, we are all created equally by God. And as such, are the objects of God's love and care, equally given. Now, the Bible is uh, a book full of the reality of human life. All our differences jumbled up together with betrayal and infidelity and violence and dysfunctional families and the abuse of power. In fact, every negative aspect of humanity drawn together in this chaotic complexity that we call human life. But in the midst of this, there is also beauty. There's the obvious beauty of the created world. There's the obvious beauty of humanity at its loving best. And then in glimpses, 
were given, uh, were, were shown the kingdom of God, renewing the world in Jesus' name. And the glimpses help us understand what our future relationship with God will be. And it shows because this rebellion, this uh, fighting against God, this chaotic nature of life is something that we all do. Romans talks about uh, none of us uh, being uh, good enough to go to God. We all fall short of the glory of God. And into this amazing mass of human messy beauty, then there is God. He working on and alongside and through his people, bringing hope and opportunity and grace and love. And in our context, equality and justice. Now, it's took a while, but I came across this realisation and I saw in myself for the first time that I actually did, partly through a lack of action, partly through my own cultural understanding, but partly through bad decisions and a lack of thought and moving away from God, that I do treat people unequally. And I find it really hard sometimes to acknowledge that to myself or to you. There's a Church of England book and we'll be studying it later in the year. It's um, called Living in Love and Faith. And uh, as the idea of this book was being put together, the two archbishops, <laughs> two archbishops got together and put out a statement. And the statement began, we call for a radical, new, inclusive Christian church. And then later on, they said, based on good, healthy, flourishing relationships. We call for a radical, new, inclusive Christian church based on good, healthy, flourishing relationships. Now, I struggle with the first bit, if I'm honest, because for me, God's love shown through Jesus and the activity of the Holy Spirit has always been radical. We shouldn't be asking for a radical new church, but a Jesus-centred, Holy Spirit-led church that was always intended by Jesus. And yes, it absolutely should be based on good, healthy, flourishing relationships. The other thing that saddens me is that the church has to make such a statement like this at all. But the reality is that inequality in all its forms is very alive and very kicking in today's church. And we as part of God's family need to get on our knees with humility and an openness to accept and to change. Now, what the statement doesn't say, nor should it ever say, is that we all need to be the same. Heaven forbid that God ever created more than one of me. God's call is for a relationship of patience and love and learning, where challenge comes without rebuke, and relationships are strengthened as we begin and learn to understand each other through healthy disagreement and through conversation as we learn to love as God calls us to. I just want to take a breath for a moment because I want to show you this short video, which I think helps us understand what it is I'm suggesting and saying and asking.
I wonder then, in the light of what I've had to say to this point, when you are living and working and serving for God, wherever that is, in the shop, as a welcomer at the back of church, in your family life, as you're walking down the street, as you walk in to work, that the person in front of you, sometimes as annoying and frustrating as that person can be, reflects the love of God in their lives, that they too are made equal in God. And our call as a Christian organisation and as Christian family is to treat them with equality and love and grace. And that's our challenge. That's what we call for when we use this word in the context of what life should be like in All Saints Church. <clears throat> so, having said that, there are one or two things that I think I can challenge you over and that hopefully they can lead to questions that you can consider yourself. And we need to recognise, therefore, the following. And the first one is simply this, that this is not just an issue of skin colour, although the issue of skin colour is very real. But it is also many of the different things, things that reflect our individuality, things that we identify with, that seem somehow to make us better and more powerful than other people. And of course, this includes race, but it also includes addiction and homelessness and political differences, and many other things as well. I believe our start into this conversation is that we say sorry that we recognise our own humanity, our own fallenness, the place that we play either in our activity or our lack of activity in inequality within our world. And that we must then, at number three, lament the unequal behaviour that happens within our world, bring it to God, call it out to God, enable God's heart to be touched and our hearts to be touched by the needs of others. And then we must stand alongside for whom those for whom life is the hardest to walk their journeys. And then we must teach that in Jesus we are all equal, all of us, all equal. And we must continually shout that, continually say that, continually uh, teach that within the life of our church. Now, of course, underlying all this and something I haven't mentioned to this point is prayer. Let's pray for a change. Let's pray for a change through our culture. Let's pray for a change through our church community. Let's pray for equality in all its forms. <coughs> and the next one is that God is the place for real equality and the place we must never take our eyes from. When our eyes are on Jesus, we become more like him. And the job and the role of our church community is simply to enable us together to be able to do that. And then to shout for those who need a voice, to cry with those who are abused, to celebrate victory, to worship God and to enable the kingdom of God that we so long for to be real and relevant and evident in our lives, in our church's life, but more importantly, I think, in our community's life. Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for loving us and we pray with our hearts and hands open to you. We are sorry, Lord Jesus, for our inactivity. We are sorry, Lord Jesus, for those things that we have done and said which have led to an unequal world. Father God, forgive us and may we change to be more like Jesus. Keep our eyes fixed on you. And may we shout and cry with those who are treated less than you made them to be. Lord God, in your name we pray. Amen. Lord, I stand in the midst of a multitude Of those from every tribe and tongue we are your people, redeemed by your blood, rescued from death by your love. Oh, yes. There are no words good enough to thank you. There are no words to express my praise. But I will lift up my voice.
Let's come together now for our time of prayer. The response to each prayer is, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. First of all, thinking about our theme of equality and picking up that short video. When somebody stood in front of you, who do you see? Do you see somebody loved and known and created in the image of God? Let's begin our prayer time by saying sorry. For those times when we have failed to recognise God's presence in the person in front of us. Lord Jesus, we are sorry for the way sometimes we have treated people without respect and love and humanity. Help us in future to recognise your presence in all people, to treat people with equality and love and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our Church of All Saints. We pray that we will be a place that will treat people with equality and love. That we will recognise in all who come to this place and in all whom we serve the presence of you, Lord Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray into our community, wherever we are at this moment. We pray for peace on our streets. We pray for safety. We pray against the evils of crime. We pray, Lord Jesus, as a church community, we would stand alongside those who are victims. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray across the world. And we think of Christians who are persecuted for their faith. We pray in Algeria for a pastor who has been sentenced for being a Christian. And we pray, Lord Jesus, in his appeal that justice will be seen to be done. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Iran, a church under greater and greater threat. We think, Lord Jesus, of those Farsi speaker and Iranians who are part of our own church congregation. And we thank you for them and we pray for their families wherever they are at this moment. We think of our friends and brothers and sisters in Uganda. And we pray for Reverend Alex and his whole congregation. We think of the awful situation in India with COVID at the moment. Lord Jesus, Enable your church to stand alongside those who are struggling the most, to bring hope and peace and healing into so many desperate situations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for our own government and for wisdom to make the right decisions. We also pray, Lord Jesus, that having reduced our UK aid budget by 30%, a reduction of £3.5 billion, we seek wisdom and best judgment in our current government that that aid would be returned to its use. Lord Jesus, we understand and know that people are struggling and going hungry because of that lack of money, and we pray into that situation that justice will prevail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's spend a moment or two remembering those people who we know, whether through illness or situation or family breakdown, are really struggling at this moment. I'm going to allow a few moments of silence and in that silence just name before God those people who are on your heart. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Let's say together in the language or tradition with which we are most comfortable the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we come to our time of notices. As usual, we'll continue to have prayers each morning and on Wednesday evenings, 9 o'clock in the morning, 7.30 on Wednesday evening on Zoom. Our Bible Book Club will be meeting again on Tuesday at 4 o'clock again. This is a Zoom meeting. And time for birthdays. And this week, it, we can celebrate the birthdays of both of our vicars. It was uh, Bob's birthday on Thursday and it's Mike's birthday on Saturday. So let's listen to the birthday song and join in. If you listen carefully at the end, somebody asks, whose birthday is it? When he asks that question, perhaps we can just tell them that it is Mike's birthday, it's Bob's birthday. So let's listen to the birthday song. One, two, three. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. To you. Round of applause. So as we come to the end of our service together, um, let's, I will say a final prayer for us and then the blessing from, from Numbers. Be with us, Lord, as we go out into the world. May the lips that have sung your praises always speak the truth. May the ears which have heard your word Listen only to what is good, and may our lives, as well as our worship, be always pleasing in your sight. To the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And now our final hymn, Go Forth and Tell, God's Love Embraces All. <laughs>